So, in preparation of this week's video, I've spent the last week practicing magic. Yes, I actually have a real Harry Potter wand and I've been practicing magic, so I am now gonna fix my glasses so I don't have to wear them anymore and that you can't see the reflection of the big bright lights. Ready, should we give it a try? Abracadabra! Oh, I've turned into Neil from Real World Magic. Awesome. Could be worse. I could be John Joe. So I'm Berry Man, and in today's video, I'm going to be doing 10 things wrong with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Now, how do I change back? Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone is a 2001 fantasy film directed by Chris Columbus. It tells the story of Harry Potter's first year at Hogwarts Witchcraft and Wizardry as he discovers that he's actually a famous wizard. He begins his education and also finds out the truth of how he became the orphan and the scar on his forehead. When the film was released, it actually got praised so much and was the highest grossing film of 2001. So what has, uh, have I, the nitpicking YouTuber, actually found wrong with this film? Well, here's 10 things wrong with Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. Number 10, should have been a TV series. Right, back to normal. Might not play with this anymore. Anyway, yes, this should have been a TV series. Why? Well, out of all the seven books, this actually has the smallest page count. Yet there was stuff missing from the film that was in the book. Now, could it have been, if it was in the TV series, all of that information would have paid across. I mean, one thing that comes across in all the books is actually the friendship between all of the uh, people in Harry's year. That doesn't come across in the films. It's literally just the core people, and that's it. Also, the adventures of uh, the Dueling Cup, not in this film. And there's so much in the future films that's cut out where it wouldn't have been if this was a TV series. Now obviously a TV series would not have made as much money, so it's a fine line, but yeah, I think a TV series, we would have got a more in-depth Harry Potter series. Number nine, name change. So in America and India, bizarrely enough, it's not called the Philosopher's Stone, it's called the Sorcerer's Stone. Now in America, the reason being is they thought kids wouldn't be interested in a book that says Philosopher's Stone, hence why they changed it to Sorcerer's Stone. Now here's the kicker. The actual stone is called a Philosopher's Stone. Now, I may be wrong, but I cannot find any references to anything called a Sorcerer's Stone. It doesn't exist. Where a Philosopher's Stone does exist in mythology. It's been around since the Middle Ages where a stone can turn metal into gold, the art of alchemy. And yes, it does produce an elixir of life that can grant the user immortal. But you've changed the name of it because you thought people wouldn't understand and you changed it to something you completely made up and not accurate. It is actually called a Philosopher's Stone. There was no need for the name change. Number eight, letters. I'll let you all into a little secret. When I watched this, I actually watched this with my girlfriend and her daughter writing the script, and she has actually helped me write the script for this week's video, and this is actually one of her entries, and it's a good entry. So when all the letters are breaking into number four pivot drive, there's letters everywhere, so they come flying through the window, flying through the uh, fireplace, and then land on the floor. So what does Harry do? He jumps up on the buffet, starts jumping up in the air to try and grab on the letters. Why don't you just pick one of the ones up off the floor? There's hundreds on the floor. It would have been a lot easier, a lot quicker, and you might have actually got away and opened your letter, but why were you jumping? Just pick one up off the floor. They're everywhere. Number seven, destroying the wand shop. I need the wand back for this section, but in the film, when they're trying out new wands, they pick up a wand and go whoop, and something blows up. You're also doing this before the school year. So you are gonna be seeing, according to John Joe, around about 26 to 50 kids who are all going to be blowing up your shop. Why? If you're gonna do that, why don't you have like a firing range at the back so you're not damaging your shop every five seconds? I know you can magic it better, but still, it's a waste of time. Now what actually happens in the books is when you pick up a wand, 
you get this aura or nothing. So if nothing happens, it's not your wand. If you pick it up and there's an aura, which does happen in the film, it's your wand. But in the film, you're just destroying an old man's wand shop every five seconds. I feel sorry for him. No wonder he's always cranky. Number six, how does the money work? One thing you see in this film is that the Wizarding World has its own money. And you see when Harry Potter opens his vault, he has money everywhere. But how does it work? Now in the book, it is explained. You may not get it, but it is explained. In the film, it's like, yeah, there's your money. Well, how's it work? Well, quite simply, it's basically bronze, silver, and gold. But that's not what they call it. Basically call it galleon, which is gold, sickle, which is silver, and nut, which is bronze, equivalent. But it's not a decimal system as we know it. It's not 100 sickles to a galleon. It doesn't work like that. How does it work? Well, it works like this. 29 nuts in a sickle and 17 sickles in a galleon. I'm hoping I'm getting this right because Neil at Real World Magic will kill me if I've got this wrong. Now, what does it mean in the real world? Well, approximately, a galleon is just under five pounds, and in the US, a galleon is roughly around about $6.60. So that's how much, you, when you get big poles of it, you know, you're rich. Number five, cards. One of the biggest mysteries of this film is, who is Nicholas Flamel? Now, if you've ever read the book, it actually tells you quite early on who Nicholas Flamel is, and then obviously tells you at the same point as it does in the film. Now, in the film, when you actually find out, they don't actually tell you at all. They pick up the card and say, oh, I've got a Dumbledore card, but they don't read what's on back. Now, I reckon they should have left it in because I remember when I'm reading the book for the first time, it went straight, straight through me when i got to that part it says oh look it's on the back of the card i knew i'd seen that name somewhere do you know what i did i went back to that chapter and reread it. it was like oh yes i did now if you've done that in the film i actually did it how the book i can guarantee the first time people watching like me would have actually gone back and rewound it or gone back to the chapter and watched that scene because you're like oh yeah they did but you didn't, and then it would have been a nice, fun little thing to do. But you didn't want to take risks on a film like this, did you? Number four, Hogwarts Song. In the books, at the start of every school year, they sing the Hogwarts Song, which, bizarrely enough, will go with any tune on the planet. That would have been awesome, especially as Fred and George actually did the funeral march to it, and Dumbledore let them get away with it. You didn't do it. You didn't even do it, any sort of interpretation of it. I mean, how many schools, especially middle, first to middle school, did you have to sing songs? But I don't know. It would just added that fun little thing. It's like Hogwarts, Hogwarts, Hoggy, Hoggy, Hogwarts. I cannot believe I've just sung that. Number three, Peeves the Poltergeist. One of the funniest characters in the book is Peeves the Poltergeist. Half the stuff he gets up to is hilarious. It doesn't really flow the story, but it's hilarious. And it's a nice little break, especially in a book. Now the character was cast, and it was cast perfectly as Rick Mayo. I don't think anyone else is more perfect to play Peeves the Poltergeist. So what do they do? They cut him out. Now I know Rick Mayo did take this personally and refused to watch this film and had never watched this film up to the day he passed away, rest in peace. But he was perfect. And same again, it would have just broken up, had these fun little skits, like they do with Ice Age, with the little mouse, something like that with Peeves the Poltergeist in this film. It would have been brilliant, but no. Number two, Quidditch. Now, a lot of the films are guilty of this, but I'm gonna pick it out on the first film, because where are the other Quidditch matches? You don't just have Gryffindor versus Slytherin. What about Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw? What about Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff? Slytherin versus Hufflepuff. All these happen, but you only ever hear about the one. And this is the thing, it actually turned out to be a plot point because they never won the Quidditch Cup. Because Harry Potter was injured for the final match, they had to forfeit, they lost, and Slytherin won the Quidditch Cup. Gryffindor didn't actually win the Quidditch Cup until the third film. 
and it was a nice little subplot that same again it's just good in the book and they didn't even hint at it in the film number one wrong punishment so towards the end of the film harry hermione ron they sneak out the castle at night to go and visit their friend hagrid who somehow has a dragon they're caught they're punished so what is their punishment for sneaking out the castle at night to spend time with Hagrid? Well, their punishment is to being sent out of the castle to spend time with Hagrid. <sighs> I don't think that's a good punishment. I know they end up uh, exploring the Forbidden Forest and bumping into Voldemort, but still, it's like, okay, you're barred from the PlayStation, but you can play on the Xbox. No, if you're barred from electronics, you're barred from electronics, period. But <laughs> that was a really bad punishment. Final thoughts. Now, I must admit, I never got into the Harry Potter craze until the first film came out. Now, when the first film came out, the first book was on sale for a pound in Tesco's. I read the first book and I was hooked. I actually went and bought the first four books, because there was only four books out at that time, straight away. Read them all back to back, loved it. Now, by the time I finished the books, the first film had finished its cinema run, so I had to wait until I could rent it on video. And that was the first time I actually watched it. And I was slightly disappointed. Special effects by this time had improved, and yet it seems to have gone backwards. They weren't really that good. It was more like cheesy video games rather than movie special effects. They were quite appalling. Pacing was all over the place. One thing you did get from the book is a sense of time. You get the sense it is set over the whole year. That's not something you do get from this film. And it's quite disappointing. It's like, you get the impression they're only actually there for one term, but they're not there there for three whole terms for a whole year. That being said, it is a gorgeous looking film. They actually got the characters, the casting perfectly. They got the core and the heart of the story. Now I said that a few weeks ago about Ghost of the Shell, they missed the heart. They didn't miss it with this. They got it on the head. Granted, I understand why they've cut a lot out. So people that have read the books are gonna nitpick like I did, but I can understand where they're coming from, but they got the core of it. And that was the main thing. They got the main, they got the grit of the film into this so it's not too bad it was a good fun enjoyable film to watch coming to re-review it for this video as i said i actually watched it with my family my girlfriend's daughter spent the entire film saying that this film word for word for word i'm surprised i'm not being done for murder but that's a different matter but that's the beauty of this film it is a family film everyone can sit down and watch it from someone who's in their 40s to a child in who's just approaching their teens. Enjoy this film. And sometimes that's what you want. So that's why I'm gonna give this film a nine out of 10. It has its flaws, but it's still enjoyable. And ultimately that's what you want. Something that is enjoyable to watch. Well, that's what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. If you think I'm being too nice, put your rating in the comments. But on to next week. Do you know what? I haven't done a Star Wars film in a while, so I'm going to carry on with the Star Wars series that I'm doing at the moment. Want to know what I think of that film? Come back next Sunday. Take care. Bye-bye.